But for today, we're going to talk about um, integrating biocontrol agents into protected uh, culture, not um, not necessarily outdoors, because approaches can be different um, in, in how we do this and for different regions and different pests. But with protected culture, there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, and, you know, I'm not here to talk about nursery production, but I get this all the time. They're like, oh, you can't, you know, do augmented biocontrol. You can't release beneficials outside because they'll fly away. I actually think biocontrol outdoors is almost easier than indoors because when you're in a greenhouse, you're um, excluding uh, your native beneficials from getting into the greenhouse, where outside you have all these native beneficials that are willing to come help you and work for you. So in addition to what you're releasing, you get this free workforce from outside. Now you can in greenhouse settings get native beneficials sometimes moving in um, through vents, through open doors, if sides get rolled up. But, you know, a lot of these greenhouses are pretty buttoned up. But at the same time, you know, the greenhouses are buttoned up so that they can control the climate inside and to keep pests from getting in. So there's gives and takes on, on both of them. And, you know, this little quick chart table I did here, you know, of course, there's a million other things you can add into this, but I just wanted to, you know, throw in a few points about the advantages and disadvantages to being in these protected structures. Um, another one that is an advantage that we're learning a lot more about is spray drift. Um, I've actually been learning quite a bit about pesticide residuals and spray drifts thanks to the cannabis and hemp industry because they have such strict standards on testing. So there's a lot of pesticide testing going on and we're getting these situations where we have product um, pesticides showing up on crops that have never been treated with that pesticide. And part of what I've been doing is trying to figure out how is this pesticide here when the grower didn't apply it. And being inside of a building in a structure that greatly reduces the chances of spray drift from your neighbors. Um, I had a situation uh, down in Florida where in a nursery we wanted to use biocontrol, but they were up against um, a fruit producer and the fruit farm was spraying so many pesticides and fungicides, it would just drift over in and we could never get the beneficials established in the nursery because of spray drift. So, um, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, another disadvantage we've been slowly learning about um, is pollen for beneficials. Um, a lot of the beneficial insects are uh, omnivores and they need pollen and meat in their diet. And outside, there's a lot of pollen that just blows in on the wind. Adult insects can fly to flowers outside of your crop to get it. But to compensate for that, uh, companies are now selling supplemental feeds and pollens, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, to be able to feed these beneficials. Um, Another advantage is if your bios show up and it's pouring rain, if you're in a greenhouse, you can still put them out. Outside, if it's pouring rain, you have to wait uh, really to get the beneficials out, especially if you're applying things like predatory mites. The other thing about greenhouses, and this is something um, you know we deal with a lot, is how hot it can get. Um, in the greenhouses, especially up higher. Um, and when we head further south, uh, it can be quite toasty. Where outside, yes, you can have high temperatures too, um, but it tends not to be quite as bad as those oppressive temperatures uh, inside some of the greenhouses in there. Now, the first and foremost thing, and I'm sure some of you have been to my presentations before, I mean, I can't express how important ID is over and over and over. And I get met, I've already, this morning, I think I've had three people contact me for insect ID. Um, you've got to identify what it is you have. And the first simple thing you can do is just by start by counting legs, if it has legs. Some of the immature insects don't. But, you know, if it's got eight legs, then you know it's not an insect and immediately it's, it's going to be a mite. Or if it's got... Uh, six legs, um, and as an adult, you know it's going to be an insect and more likely not a mite. I mean, you know, you get into all these, sure, when mites are attached, they have six legs, but they're so tiny, most people don't see them then. But, you know, you start 
look counting legs, you look at antenna shape, are there wings present, mites don't have wings, so you can kind of classify what it is. And then there's all these ID keys and photo guides out there. There's tons of them available. Um, and when I was in school for entomology, you know, they teach you the basics, but then basically you're kind of out there on your own where you've, you've got to learn to use these keys and guides to identify things uh, that are more specific for what you're doing. And um, I'll talk about these resources coming up too. And if you don't know what it is, um, if you can get a good photo and uh, photography has come a long way. You know, when I was in middle school, you know, I was developing my own film. Um, in my dark room in my bathroom and you had to be so careful taking pictures and macro was only so good compared to now you know um, ha having the, the right tools and the digital photography industry has gotten so inexpensive um, there's no excuse to not be able to afford one of these usb microscopes to be able to get good images if you can't or i still say even if you do get a photo is to collect a sample in alcohol. This photo in the right, what I like to do is when you have a leaf with let's say mites or aphids on it, if you just dip it in a vial with alcohol and kind of shake it, and then you can pull the leaf out, the insects and mites will just fall into the alcohol because you don't want the plant material in the alcohol, you just want the insects. And then you can cap it and now you've got your insects. And then uh, for some things like mites and thrips and stuff, it's best if we slide mount them to uh, get identification for them um, because some plant material you can't ship or if you try to ship plant material with insects on it, it can mold um, or the insects might leave the plant. So having these little vials of alcohol, I uh, always carry about five or six in my scouting bag to be able to put samples in um, is, is a good backup way because you know ID is becoming more and more important today. Um, why? Because biocontrol agents are very targeted. When we're getting into aphid management, it's a lock and key system with the parasitoids. Certain parasitoids only hit certain aphids. And you don't want to be putting out parasitoids you don't need to be paying for if if you don't have an aphid they can control. So we have to identify what the aphid is, look to see if there's a parasitoid for it, and then if it is, we can target releasing that one. The other thing is, is not all insects and mites are bad. Um, uh, this picture down on the lower right here, several times this year, people have sent me pictures of this, asking for ID on this caterpillar. This is actually a predatory fly larva called a surfeit fly, flower fly, hover fly, there's numerous names for it that is predatory on aphids. And I've actually had growers in the past spring to kill these thinking they're caterpillars. And actually those are free workers uh, that have shown up for you. So, uh, you know, ID is really critical because do you really need to treat for it? Another reason why is, is, you know, this is not pest management of 1980s where you had very broad organophosphates and, and products that killed almost everything. These new products today are so targeted and it's good because we're not going in and killing everything. Um, Ventigra is a newer product to the market um, from BSF that really gets in there and targets white flies and aphids. So if you're using this, um, it's not going to kill things like, you know, grasshoppers or thrips or other pests, which you may say, well, I want something that's going to kill multiple things. But with it being dialed in to be so specific on certain pests, then for most of the time, and I will say in this case, it's very compatible with many of the natural enemies. So it's a product that you can use in conjunction with your natural enemies so you can get a one-two punch managing your pests. Same thing um, like with Botanigard, the WP, we use this a lot in combination with the predatory mites um, because Botanigard is an insecticide targeting thrips, white flies, aphids, things like that, where we can use this wettable powder formulation in conjunction with predatory mites that are also feeding on thrips. So we can hit them at multiple life stages and using these in a combination program. And so this is why ID is really important to be able to really dial in your pest management program today. And thrips are something that growers have gotten incredibly better about managing. But something I do want to mention is, is if you go in and you just type, you know, greenhouse and thrips problems or whatever, almost everything, almost, is going to come up with Western flower thrips. This thrips on the right. Um, 
And it's very common in, in the US and Canada and other countries. But coming from Florida and working in other warmer climates, this is not always what we see. But when you look for information on it, um, all, all roads almost lead back to Western flower. The problem is, is if you have a different thrip species, uh, like the poinsettia thrips on the left, and I, I don't care for the name poinsettia thrips because it makes you think it's specific to poinsettias and it is not. Um, it has a very wide host range. I've seen it on lots of ornamentals. I've seen it on the vegetables. Uh, it's in cannabis. So it, it does have a wide host range. The problem is, is the programs for biocontrol for Western flower thrips will not work to control poinsettia thrips. It has a different biology. It has different behaviors. So you, you really have to get in there and know which thrips you're dealing with. And it, it, it's challenging if you're in <clears throat> zone, you know, growing zone nine or eight, because again, everything's geared more towards growing zone six and five and the pests up there when it comes to biocontrol. Not everything, but a lot of it is. And for Thrips ID, um, and you know, here we go saying, oh, the South is so different, but here's a key to you know, Canadian greenhouses. Well, this can still work for not all uh, the species in the South, because this is again targeting for Canadian greenhouses, but this is an excellent key if you haven't downloaded. And this is designed for uh, growers where they go through, they give you the basic anatomy on here, and then, uh, Sarah has done these great line drawings in here um, and explaining how to tell them apart. And this is why you need magnification to, you know, how do you tell an echinothrips from an onion thrips from a Western flower thrips? Um, and it, it, once you get in there and start looking at these thrips, you can see the difference. And this is a super helpful key. Um, this is... <laughs> This is the web address where it's parked, but it's just easier to, to Google, you know, Canadian greenhouse, uh, you know, thrips key and it, it will come up. Now, another really good tool, and it was funny because when I was just talking to Airfon, I could see this on his table behind him and we didn't plan that at all, but he actually has a copy right, right in his hand <laughs> right there. There it is. Um, this is another good key that was designed for growers to use for pest uh, thrips identification, which has a bit more of these, I will say, tropical and subtropical thrip species in it. Um, for a while, they did produce those nice laminated copies. They're, they're, they're not doing it anymore. You're going to have to pry mine or Airfon's copy out of our cold, dead hands because we will not give it up. But it's available as a free PDF. So you can download it. If you want to go print it, you can, but if not, you can have it on your phone or your computer. And again, it had this crazy long web address. So if you just, and I just did this this morning to make sure it works. If you just Google key pest thrips, Florida, it is the first thing that will come up the PDF for it because Florida has it on their IFAS website. And I just threw it up in the chat as well. Oh, thank you, Airfon. Um, so these, um, th this key again, well, it's not a key. It's more of a, a picture book and saying, hey, here's what it looks like and here's the damage. But also what I really like, too, is it's like, well, if you think it's this thrips, also look at these because these can look similar. So it's really got some good user information. And there is another one of these um, on mealybugs that's out there. Um, if you're interested in mealybug ID, I've been begging, begging for them to do one on mites because I think a mite, one of these would be really excellent to have. So speaking of mites, so the good old two spot spider mite, um, you know, with, with identification, I don't want to say it's gotten trickier, um, but it has a little bit. Um, we've seen this phenomenon lately, um, and I've talked with lots of other bug nerds at meetings, and where we're seeing a lot more of what we call the red form of the two spot spider mite. Um, and that is what is on the left. That's what I'm looking at in this little cartoon thing here. That is a two spot spider mite. It's the same species as the one on the right, but it's considered the red form of it. Where this gets confusing in more tropical environments or warmer environments is we do have a lot of other, what I call red little spider mites. Spider mites is a whole family. Two spot spider mites is one species in there. There's other red mites like Tetranicus tumid, Tetranicus gloveri, there's other Tetranicus species. And it takes quite a skill level to be able to tell them apart. And 
how I became aware of this is uh, in Florida on tropical foliage, cannas, Diefenbachia, um, things of those nature, we were releasing lots of persimilis to control two spot spider mite. And it was working really well, but then we started seeing all these red mites and we're like, why is it eating the red form of the two spot spider mite? And so I started sending them off to uh, Florida uh, DPI to get ID. And it's interesting, they came back that they weren't two spot spider mites, uh, that they were these other, especially Tetranicus tumid species, because Persimilis will not feed on it. Now, I've not had this phenomenon up north when we're treating for spider mites that you put Persimilis out, they remove two spots, and then another spider mite species moves in to take its place in the ecology, like I've seen in warmer environments. So I want to warn you, if you're going to do a Persimilis program in the South, make sure you're scouting really well um, to make sure you don't get any secondary pests move in that Persimilis is not controlling. Um, so, um, and again, to tell these little uh, red mites apart, um, you pretty much have to send them in for identification. Something I will say though, interesting is if you're doing, growing anything in the milkweed family, um, because milkweeds are very big today for all the monarch gardening, for some reason, um, two spots on those plants love to be red. And all the red mites I've sent in uh, to be identified have always come back as two spot spider mites. So if it's on milkweed, there's a really good chance it is just two spot. But if it's on some of these other tropicals, again, like canna, um, and, uh, uh, oh, not Aristolochia. Um, oh, it's the V-shaped leaf plant. Ah, um, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, that one, uh, who tends to spider mites, that will end up with these other red mites too. So just, you've got to monitor. You can't just release these beneficials and walk away. Um, you've got to keep an eye on them while they're out there. But I mean, Erfan, have you seen more of these red forms of two spots around? Uh, I, I don't know if I could say that they've actually increased in frequency, but uh, I still see them occasionally. Yeah, I, I've over, well, I've been, I guess I've been looking at them for 30 years. I'm old. Um, and, and also it could be because, you know, when I started off, I was just in Florida and now I've been traveling all over the place. It could be because I'm in more places, I'm seeing more of them. But um, I, I'm talking to other people, other people have said they've seen an increased amount of them. And I, I don't think anybody really knows why um, on that. And, and I know that there's been some recent work, I mean, similar with the sweet potato white flies where they're saying that they are uh, like a bunch of cryptic species that they're saying that two spotted spider mites might actually be a whole bunch of cryptic species. So we might be seeing the abundance of some of these species that, you know, are, are different color morph kind of increase as well, uh, or, or have a higher propensity to be a different color perhaps, but I'm not sure. I don't see how there couldn't be. I mean, seriously. And, you know, that was one of the things I know um, there's discussions about looking at more genetic work on the predatory mites from insectaries because, you know, you've got these isolated colonies that have been bred for decades now. And how can one company's colony be the exact same as another colony that's been bred? I mean, you think about how many generations they've had over the decades, um, you know, on a different continent under different growing conditions. I mean, it's, it would make sense. But what's interesting is with these red forms, when they first hatch out, the protonyms, when they're, they're itty bitty babies, they look exactly like two spots right then. It's as each successive molt, they become redder, which is kind of interesting. They're not born red. So that's kind of a little interesting thing there. But for more ID information, I do on I, my website, Bug Lady Consulting, which I, I redid this summer, sitting at home. Um, I, I have, if you go to the home screen on the left-hand side, there's a Bug Lady book link, click on it. And I have just a whole list of books and also a lot of free PDFs and things like that with information on it where you can get more ID information. Also, there's some good websites. Um, I really suggest all greenhouse growers, if you're not on the uh, On Floor Culture e-newsletter uh, that goes out with Sarah uh, Jandresic up there in Canada to be on it. Uh, Featured Creatures has some really good information. I'm happy to see they've been keeping updating the website with new information on a lot of 
pests with ID and biology and beneficials too. And then bug guide is one of those that can help you with ID, but I will say bug guide generally focuses more on larger insects, but sometimes it can help out with some of the aphid species by having some really good photos. And bug guide is vetted by entomologists. So they do have people checking to make sure the pictures actually are what they say they are, which a lot of other websites don't have specialists doing that. Um, so those are a few websites there um, that can help. And be really careful. I know everybody loves social media these days. This is one of my favorite snippets I have saved uh, from Facebook, you know, and, you know, and free advice is free advice. So here this person was trying to get an ID on this. And, you know, the first comment is fast use movers are usually the good guys. Then again, they might be fungus canats, um, which, you know, and any bug nerd will know this is an aphid. And, you know, and you have so many people guessing on social media when asking for advice. Uh, Instagram is just the worst. I, I bang my head every day because everybody thinks they are a professional. Just be careful with the free advice you get online um, because a lot of those people are just guessing and it's hard to tell because you can't hear voice inflection. Are they guessing or is it a fact? And it's hard to know people's credentials to know if they should be identifying things. You also have the right tools. Yay. And <laughs> I love these pictures. I have like 20 pictures of you guys out there. And I believe Steve was standing on the cinder block here. <laughs> so yes, we could... <laughs> certainly. We are too <laughs> close to in height. <laughs> Me there. That's Dr. Stephen Authors on the right with his loop um, or hand lens that he uh, has. And he observing the mythical air fawn species of Texas. Um, <laughs> You should always have your hand lens with you. Um, I am always amazed at how many facilities I go to and growers don't have hand lenses and sometimes the scouts don't even have hand lenses. Hand lenses are a cheap investment. Uh, definitely you should have them. Um, anybody dealing with the plants should have them to have the ability to be able to look at the plant and see these insects so that we can figure out what's going on i'm also a huge fan i mean i can't say it enough i even have my dynolite right here by my computer just buy a dynolite um and this way you can get good photos you can text them you can email them send them to airfon he'd be glad to help identify things for you as long as the pictures are good enough to be identifiable um Holding a hand lens up to a cell phone only goes so far. Um, if, if, if you're going to be a professional grower, you need to have the professional tools. And this tool will pay for itself in the long run, I guarantee you. So pesticides. Um, this is something I'm finding that people are, look, are not looking into enough when they do start a biocontrol program. When I go into a facility to work with them, um, I want to see for that crop, and yes, I know if the crops have only been there, you know, for weeks, there's not going to be two months of spray records, but some of the nursery crops and some of the longer term crops um, could, have been, could have been there longer, the two months spray records for them, because I need to go through and see what, um, what has been sprayed on there. Um, and this way we can help formulate how to integrate the beneficials into these programs. Um, I also find people are not keeping good records on the releases of their beneficials. You need to keep beneficial records just like you keep pesticide records. So we know when things are released, where they were released and the rates which they were released at. When it comes to pesticides, and this is something I get asked about a lot, and this is probably one of, besides identification, then the most important part um, of doing a bio program, because you're not gonna be on 100% bios. You're gonna be on an integrated program of using spray products in conjunction with the bios. And you have to understand how they all work together. And there's a lot of great products on the market out there, but, um, I will say that sometimes when it comes to the marketing, they are a little over ambitious in their claims. Um, Fluoramite is a very good miticide. And for years, if you Googled, you know, miticide safe with beneficials, this would come up. And 
it is air quotes safe with beneficials, but you always have to ask which ones. And so this is from the BioBest side effects manual. It's it's um, you can go to the BioBest website. It, it's right on there. And so we put in Amblyseus californicus. We put in Cucamaris. We put in Swirsky and Prosimilis. So these are four different predatory mite species we use. What's interesting is Californicus and Cucamaris, a green number one means it has less than 25% mortality um, when this, this, the mites come in contact with this product. And so we consider that in the safe category that it, that it can be used. Um, what's interesting is when you get to Swirsky, Swirsky can have a number three, and that means up to 75% mortality. And if you spray it, you have to wait a week before you can release Swirsky. And with Persimilis, uh, yellow number two is about 25% mortality. And again, you have to wait a week. So as far as saying it's it's safe, I mean, it's, it's very safe with the Californicus and Cucamaris, but when you get into Swirsky and Persimilis, it doesn't act the same. So just because one product is safe with one beneficial, you cannot assume it's safe with another. Now, is this considered softer? Sure, because if you need to come in, do an application, um, and then wait a week to release Swirsky, that's not that. It's not a deal breaker. Um, so you just have to be aware of, of, of these products and how they're going to impact um, the beneficials. Now here, um, I know, um, you know, imetacloprid has fallen a little by the wayside. Uh, because of limited use, uh, because of people selling to big box retailers, but some people are still using it. But I think this is a really good example too. So on the left, we put in Cucamaris and Swirsky, again, two predatory mite species. Aphidius, that is a tiny wasp that is a parasitoid to aphids. Chrysopa carnate, that is green lacewing. And then Encarcia formosa, which Airfon has been doing work with, um, is a parasitoid to white flies. So we have a little bit of everything um, out there. Important to understand is on this chart, you have an S and S means spray, I means irrigation. And look how different the impact is on when it's sprayed compared to the way it's drenched. So how you apply a pesticide can also have an impact on these beneficials because pretty much it's it's pretty much not safe as a foliar application, but if you use it as a drench with your predatory mites, it's it's pretty safe to be using. So you do have to take this into consideration when making these decisions out there. Another thing, um, and I I keep running, I just had another grower meeting uh, earlier this week and the growers didn't realize that fungicides can have an impact on beneficials. So it's really important to look your fungicides up too. And here, you know, we have the Cucamaris. Again, this is a predatory mite that's been used, is being used very heavily for broad mite control, for Western flower thrips control. Um, it's, it's, it's a very commonly used predatory mite and it's not super compatible with thiophenate methyl. You know, it's pretty much gonna kill most of your mites and Less than two weeks, but I would probably wait two weeks, but this would also come into, you know, are you an outdoor nursery in the south or are you a greenhouse up north? Because pesticides outdoors where you have irrigation, UV sunlight um, are gonna break down a little bit faster than they would in let's say a northern greenhouse on sub-irrigation. Now it can be compatible with, <clears throat> excuse me, green lacewings and avid parasitoids. But here when you get to Encarcia, the larva is inside of the, the, the dead white fly. So they're protected. But if the adult is out sitting on the leaf and it gets hit with this, that's it, it's done. Um, and if you do an application of it, you really need to wait three days. So again, um, it's important to look at this stuff. It's also nice to see now in these compatibility tables, they're adding in um, this paleomyces which is actually Isaria now. This is um, PFR 97. This is also what's in no fly and everything because you do have to look at your microbial insecticides and how they are compatible with fungicides because this is a fungus. Um, and so um, it's something that is 
I don't want to say you can't use it, but you just don't want to spray these together right on top of each other. I will say that uh, companies like BioWorks, they have really extensive compatibility information for their Botanigard products, the Bavaria Bassiana, and the Trichoderma products of which fungicides can you tank mix with, which ones can't, and all that information. They have an excellent database on that uh, for that. So that said, um, you know, with these pesticides, you always want to know the key pests in a crop. And, you know, if you're using the beneficials to target them, um, you always want to have like a contingency plan because let's say you're growing and we're going to talk about hibiscus here in a minute but you grow on hibiscus and using bios for the white flies and using predatory mite for mite management and then all of a sudden what happens if mealybug pops up you want to have a product that you can come in and spray that's going to have minimal impact on your beneficials because Mealybug biocontrol programs are really not that economical yet, and we really don't have enough options, so we do really need to spray for mealybugs. But you can get compatibility information, BioBest, Colbert, and AgroBio, which AgroBio is not in the United States yet. Um, they're a company out of Spain, but they have mobile apps you can download. And you can do that quick lookup stuff on your phone. I like looking it up on the computer because you can export, uh, you know, spreadsheets with compatibility information and you can see a lot more info on your screen. But all these companies can provide you compatibility information. The other thing we look at when making decisions about integrating biocontrols is population densities. Um, you know, they, they always talk about, you know, beneficials, you have to be proactive, you have to be preventative, you have to get them in before there's a problem. In reality, yes, if you had a leaf like this on the left, and um, it, it was absolutely covered with aphids, and you came in and you dumped thousands of lacewing larvae, would they get ahead of it? Sure, but it's going to take too long, and it's going to have too much damage to that plant by the time the beneficials catch up. And so in nature, that's what kind of happens. But in nursery and greenhouse production, we can't afford to allow that to happen. So we have to get in really early to nip that problem in the bud because we don't want sooty mold. We don't want distorted leaves. We don't want ants coming and farming them. So if I were to go into a facility and see the level of aphids on the left, we would definitely have to do a knockdown spray with um, a softer product that would allow us then to get in with beneficials afterwards. Now this middle picture, um, this was on an oleander at a nursery um, and uh, those are the oleander slash milkweed aphids that are on there. We were scouting and we saw these aphids and we noticed to the right those little grains of rice and those are surfeit fly larvae, those predatory flies that love to feed on aphids. So if I were to see that, and my recommendation to them was don't spray now, give it a couple days and come back. Mark the plant with some flagging tape um, or irrigation flags. And look, because what's gonna happen is these are gonna hatch and start feeding on those aphids. And if you come in and spray now, there's a good chance you could end up killing your free beneficials that are going to control your problem and not get 100% control of your aphids. And then you can end up in a worse situation. So, you know, when you find beneficials in conjunction with your pests, give them a chance to work. But on the right um, is a foxglove aphid. And at this point, I'm just like, if you find foxglove aphid, spray for it and kill it because it's very challenging to manage with biocontrol, especially on some of the floriculture crops like Calabrico and things like that. So this is where knowing the aphids, knowing you know a bit about their biology um, and what kind of damage they can do can help make those decisions on how to treat, when to treat in that. Uh, the foxglove aphid has a toxin in its saliva that causes plant material to become very distorted. And so you can't afford to let, um, to afford to let them to do damage where some of the other aphids don't cause that kind of damage and you have a little more time to manage them. So it's important to look at those things. So typically, the lowest levels of pests are in propagation. And this is why we have such a focus these days on managing the pests in the propagation before they get out of hand. Um, people often don't treat in prop 
there is a low level of pests there. We know that, but you don't see the damage yet. And there are, the levels are hard to detect to scout on such tiny plants. But if you can come in and get them knocked out in this stage, it's so inexpensive to treat plug trays because your rates are low, your plants are you know, packed together and it just makes sense. So there's a really a focus on starting your bio programs right in propagation to stop the problem from spreading. I, I've dealt with bitty growers that say, oh, you know, we've got mites on the ivy cuttings and it's like, well, you know, you could do, but they're like, no, no, we'll just wait and we'll deal with it once we, you know, once we pot them up or something. It's like, no, treat now, do not put it off. Also making decisions on integrating bios in, you've got, you know, how, where, and what. So how you grow is really important. Um, if you're growing on a table, it can be different than hanging baskets. How we apply beneficials. Um, whether you need to use a loose product or a sachet uh, because of having access to these areas. Also, you have to look at temperatures. Typically, if it's down lower, it's going to be cooler than hanging up. And these are all decisions that you know you and your your biocontrol specialist you're working with or your extension agent um, can help you make these decisions on what's right for those growing situations. You know, here we have Gerbera daisies where the ones on the left table were getting, uh, you know, broadcasted uh, predatory mites over the top, where the ones on the right, because you couldn't get up there to apply predatory mites every other week, those were getting sachets so that the mites then can disperse out. Also spacing down on the ground is, is important um, and thinking about how you're gonna apply because once you start spacing pots out and you need to apply predatory mites over the top of them or lace wings or things like that, a lot of them can fall to the floor. So, you know, we have to work when we organize our programs um, to, to think about that. Is it still economically feasible to apply predatory mites over plants that are spaced because if you're gonna lose, let's say 50% of the mites to the floor, then you're gonna to need to add 50% more mites to uh, your application. And so you have to look at the cost of those things where over on the right, you know, this is like a biocontrol dream to have your plants all you know, push together like that. But from a pathology standpoint, it'd be like, yeah, because you're not getting your circulation and you're more prone to disease there. So you have to find that happy medium um, and find the right methods for releasing, which is gonna work for how you grow and how you're spaced. Again, where you grow is important too. And, you know, I touched on this before. Um, and when, you know, again, I work with somebody and they call, or if you ever call me, you'll find out it's like the Spanish Inquisition. I'm gonna have a thousand questions on where you're located, you know, the crop, what you've sprayed, da, 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 da. And you can really see, um, you know, how different things are. You know, again, I grew up down there in South Florida, um, outside of Fort Lauderdale zone 10. And it was a bit of a shock to me to move up to, according to the map, I'm in zone six. I think I may be a little closer to five sometimes because we've been down to like minus 16 at our house here. Um, so it, it can be, uh, you know, chilly, but, the climate's so different. And again, so much of this research has been done for more growing zones, like for five and six, more of these European conditions. So when somebody said, well, here's some trial research, you know, where we use this predatory mite to control this spider mite and da, 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 da. You know, I want to know where this work was done and under what environmental conditions. How does that apply to, you know, down for my growers in zone nine and 10? Because it may not work um, and they might not be able to handle the heat in those conditions. Also, humidity plays into this. Um, we found the predatory mite Phytocelis persimilis. When you look at the literature, they say it's cut off is like mid 80s for using it. We have been very successful using it in Florida, even when greenhouses get up to like 105 during the day. And I believe why is because one, the persimilis can go down in the plant to, to a cooler portion of the plant, but also there's such high humidity. If we were to go out to let's say Colorado into like high desert, it's not going to work the same because it, the environment is so dry out there. So you have to look at all these different things and see how it's going to apply for your growing situation. Because again, um, you know, the South is very different. Uh, 
to deal with than the northern ones. Also, what you grow makes a difference. Um, is biocontrol going to work for you? On the left is a hydroponic lettuce crop in a greenhouse. On the right, floriculture. You know, for aphid management, we use a lot of these little parasitic wasps. Um, uh, there's Ophidius colmani, Ophidius irvi, and these guys, these ladies fly around and look for aphids to lay their eggs in. And what you can end up with is with these brown mummies. So if you have a brown mummy here or there in a hanging basket, is it the end of the world? No. On a landscape shrub, no. If you're doing lettuce that's going into somebody's salad, that's going to be a problem because people don't want aphid mummies in their food crops. That doesn't mean you can't use parasitoids in lettuce, but if you have any kind of detectable population, you probably need to do something else first to get those numbers down uh, because you don't want to see mummies on, again, things like cut herbs, bagged lettuce and things like that, where in floriculture, you know, a mummy here and there is never going to be seen. So you have to look at what your crop is to make a decision on if the beneficials are right for you and then which beneficial is going to be right for you under that growing situation. And, you know, hibiscus, you know, it was always a pain to grow. And now, you know, we've got the hibiscus bud weevil to make life more complicated. Um, when you have crops like hibiscus um, and, and you look at, it gets spider mites, it gets broad mites. Uh, they, there, there's a, uh, the, there's a gall midge that can cause bud drop. There's now the hibiscus bud weevil, um, uh, white fly. I mean, there's, there's a whole list of things. And, you know, you sometimes have to look that, do we have biocontrol agents for most of those problems? Yes, we have biocontrol agents for spider mites. We have biocontrol agents for broad mites. We have parasitoids and predatory mites for white flies. Um, we do not have a biocontrol agent yet for the hibiscus bud weevil. Uh, I know there's some trial work going on, um, the University of Florida, and I know you guys in Texas have done some stuff in the past. Um, you sometimes have to, to weigh this out that, yeah, we have all these beneficials that control most pests. Is it worth releasing all these beneficials or is being on a, a good soap or oil, which also can control a lot of these pest program, the right choice? Or do you need to do a combination program of those? So when you get into these crops that have very complex pest systems, you really have to look close and make these decisions. Um, I do have um, many hibiscus growers um, on biocontrol programs in Florida um, because the predatory mites work so well. And especially when you look at these tables, how they're so dense in there together, spraying is going to be very challenging in this situation. If you do grow them up, and these are on elevated benches, it's a little hard to see um, from the camera angle. But with that, you can spray up from underneath under the benches to get the undersides of the leaves. But if you're growing on the floor, you're never going to get the good spray coverage. And that's where predatory mites might really be a better option and the beneficials because they can get down into the canopy. So, you know, I just can't say if somebody just says, hey, is biocontrol the right option for hibiscus? I'm going to say it depends because it depends on which pest you're dealing with and how you grow elevated on the floor, how they're spaced. Because in some situations, bios might be better. In some situation, a spray program might be better. So there's not one easy answer. And so this is why it's important to have a bug nerd friend to work with um, to help figure out what, what is going to be the best for your system there. And beneficials do have needs. Um, Luckily in the South, we don't have to worry about the these, you know, minimum of 12 hours of light too much. In northern climates, we do. And I do know uh, we do have people on the webinar from all over the country. Um, so you do have to be that the, there are some light requirements for some of the beneficials. Um, you do have to check your temperatures. Again, I, I go with temperatures sometimes as a starting point recommendation. But then again, I like to see how far we can push them. Again, the persimilis in Florida is an excellent example um, of we have been able to get persimilis to work year round in Florida. Um, 
because we have these other environmental things like humidity that helps us again their behavior of where they move in the plant canopy but it does kind of give you a good starting uh, point on some of the recommended temperatures but remember these bugs don't read their literature that the biocontrol companies write for them and so they don't always follow the rules um, so temperatures to me are a suggestion to start with and if something's not working, then we can change it up. But I like to push them and see how, how far we can get with them temperature wise uh, for cooler and warmer. Now also beneficials do have other food requirements. Um, they tend to be again, more omnivores um, and uh, they'll eat lots of different things. A lot of the beneficials needs pollen, other protein sources, and a lot of the biocontrol companies um, like uh, BioBest has a pollen source. Uh, most companies are now uh, selling uh, Aphestia eggs, which are dead moth eggs as a protein source. That's what's up on the top right. Those are post-it notes with uh, moth eggs that a grower is going to put out in her crop. You can buy them pre-done on cards. Um, the BioB has BioArtline, which is a... Um, and I know they hate when I call them dead sea monkey eggs, but everybody knows what sea monkeys are. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's basically a, a dead shrimp egg on there. And again, it's like a protein bar that you can put out in your crop for beneficials. Uh, so there, there's lots of uh, different food sources available to help up your game. Um, you know, you can eat healthy, but some people still take vitamins and some people still drink protein shakes. So that's kind of what this is. This is a way to supplement into your diet for your beneficials. On the lower right um, is a pepper plant. Pepper pollen is has been great for beneficials like aureus and swirsky, and they absolutely love it. So you can do that by providing banker plants. That does get into a bit more complex of a program, and I never recommend people that are starting with beneficials to start with banker plant systems um, because they can be challenging. I think sometimes using these other supplemental feed methods may work um, easier for growers. But be aware that you can supplement your beneficials so that you can get more out of them today. Also be aware beneficials um, don't target all life stages of, of insects. And you have to understand when you put a beneficial at what, what they are gonna eat. So let's say you have Western flower thrips or even like onion thrips and you release predatory mites like Swirsky or Cucamaris. And then you come back three or four days later and you still are finding adult thrips. So you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, it doesn't work. Well, no, because those predatory mites really only target the first, and I hate to even say second, there's a little bit where Swirsky can snack on second instars of thrips, but really what they're going after is that first instar. We do know now, thanks to some research from BioBest, that a Swirsky and Cucamaris can also predate on thrips eggs in the tissue. So if you just release predatory mites, you're going to have to wait for all those adult thrips to die off, all the thrips pupating in the soil to emerge out. And that's why we use different beneficials in conjunction with each other to target the different, low, different life stages. So you've got these thrips pre pupa and pupa down uh, heading to this, well, the pre-pupa, once they get down to the soil and the pupa, once it's in the soil, this is where we'll put a different predatory mite, uh, Australiolalops, that lives in the soil and will eat those pupa. There's rope beetles that will eat their pupa and nematodes are probably the most popular one used. So you've got one species of mite on the plant working on the eggs, first instar, then in the soil, you've got nematodes, mites, and beetles eating those uh, uh, pupa in pupa in the soil and then for the adult thrips that are at cruising around aureus is one that's used quite regularly aureus the minute minute pirate bug and that really likes to go after adults it can eat on the immature life stages too but this way you can target a pest in multiple different life stages same thing with fungus gnats that there's um for the eggs, the beetles like row beetles and uh, the predatory mites, the Australiolalops can target them. Same thing with the larva, but the larva, the nematodes can target. But commercially, there's nothing available for adults. So when people treat for fungus gnats, I always tell them you gotta wait a week 
maybe 10 days before you really see a decline in your adult population. There are some native or naturally occurring predators that will feed on fungus gnats, but there's fungus gnats adults, but there's nothing commercially you can buy that will control fungus gnat adults as far as biocontrol. So you do have to understand what stages you're targeting. And again, if you're working with somebody, they can explain this to you, or they'll just say, again, do this, this, and this, and you'll see your results in X amount of days. But it's important to understand that because again, if you just come in and do a drench in nematodes, and then you come back and check in five days for fungus nets, you may still have a high population because you haven't given time for those beneficials to work out there. Proper application is really critical. Um, this is one, I, you know, I see people spending all this money on applying beneficials. I'm sorry, I spend all this money on buying beneficials and then they don't apply them correctly. And there's not always one application method that's perfect for everybody. You have to understand what's going to work in your system. Um, this is uh, Phytocelis persimilis. I, I, I use them a lot in my discussions because most people know them. Um, and it's a very well studied predator. There's so many ways to apply persimilis. The top left, there are these Hanging sachets, they are not slow release. It's you hang them and all the mites are gonna be out in a few hours. Uh, there's that way, there's um, the lower left, there's a nipple top vial, which is one of my favorite ways to apply them. There's small shakers, there's blowers. You can just drop them right out of the bottles. Drones are applying them, or you can just get straight cups of persimilis with no carrier, which they call the persimilis bomb. So there's so many ways you can apply them you have to find what's going to work in your system uh, for how you grow and what's going to be the most l least labor intensive because labor is becoming a bigger, bigger part of biocontrols um, that how can we get the cost down on applications. So you have to look at all these different ways. And again, working with your, your bug nerd friends uh, to get the right application for you. Same thing with lace wings. Um, this is a Hexel product that comes from Beneficial Insectary um, that you can buy um, where I like pros and cons. I mean, I like it because you can see all the lacewing larvae in there. Putting this out for, for a big commercial nursery, I do not think is the right way to go. Botanical gardens, yes, this is a good way to go. So you have to look again at who you are, how you're applying. Um, Beneficial also has on the left these egg cards that you can apply lacings with. You, you rip these cards apart and you hang them and the eggs hatch and they crawl off onto the plant. I love that application. Sometimes it can be challenging if you have ants and we all know about ants in the south. I mean, there's a lot of ants and they can strip those eggs off of there. But do be careful on your applying. Here they had put lacewing larva in the bio box and below it, they hung their sachet. The lacewing larva came right, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Lacewing larva came right out and right there, the lacewing larva was just sitting and eating on the predatory mites as they were coming out. So don't, you have to think about where you're putting your beneficials in relationship to each other because when you have generalist predator, predators, they'll eat the beneficials just like they'll eat the pests. Um, let me just go forward on this. The other thing is you have to make sure you follow your directions. Um, this makes me crazy when people rip open the sachets because you've just killed the sachets. And I see this over and over again. The employees think they're doing the right thing because they don't realize there's a tiny pinhole up here where they're coming out. Make sure you give very clear directions to your employees and applications. And if you're doing any of these blister packs, you have to make sure you open them to put them out. The insects will not chew their way out of those. But here you can see too, this one had been ripped open and this one here, I mean, and there were thousands of these like this. There needs to be just a class on positioning of sachets because you've got to get the sachets positioned just right so that these mites can slowly release over a four to six week period. And basically all they've done here is drowned them. Uh, they need to be up in the canopy of the plant near to where the pest issue is towards the middle of the plant because they need humidity, but not that much humidity on there. So follow up, you want to make sure that your bios are actually working. 
talk to your supplier, talk to your extension about what you can expect to see. I think one of the biggest surprise for most people is microbials. Um, this is an image from BioWorks. You know, these are healthy white flies. These are white flies and uh, that have been killed with Botanigard and they're not little white floof balls. Um, and a lot of people think when you use these microbial products, you would expect to see white floof balls, but you don't. You get this orangey maroony kind of color change in there. Also, again, with using uh, the parasitic wasp, this is what you can expect to see. This is a little scary because, you know, are you going to be able to send this plant to, to, to sale? And not really. Um, even though there's no aphids left alive on here, um, it, it's unsightly. So probably an initial knockdown spray needed to be done here to get the numbers down before they release the parasitoids. But working with your supplier, ask them, okay, if I'm putting out aureus, what should I see? If I'm putting out Encarsia, what should I see? To know, um, so that you know what to look for to know if your products are working or not. And the last thing is economics. Um, this is something that, um, you know, it needs to be looked at. Uh, again, I've been involved with this industry for a long, long time. And I will say the actual price of beneficials themselves have been coming down. Um, beneficials are a lot cheaper than what they used, what um, it used to be uh, back when I was actually selling beneficials in the 90s. I've saved all the price lists from all the companies through the years. And it's been interesting to see how the prices have come down on there. But you do have to take into account the cost of the biocontrol agents themselves, the shipping cost, application time. And also there is a learning curve. You need to get educated on this stuff and you need to make sure if you're going this way, your employees are educated on it so you don't waste money on products. So they need to be educated thoroughly on this um, so that in the long run, you can save money. People often don't include or think about when using biocontrol agents that going this way, we don't have to worry about resistance issues, which is a huge concern with pesticides. I mean, we hear, you know, there's all these talks on rotations and mode of actions. You don't have to worry about that with the biocontrol agents. You don't have to worry about pesticide residues. Um, one of the real advantages too is people can be out applying these beneficials while your workers are working. So you don't have to shut an area down of your greenhouse and you don't have to worry about REIs with them. Um, the biocontrol agents are working for you 24 seven. So when you go home at night, they're still working. I think there's tons of marketing opportunities here to market how we're doing pollinator friendly pest management. And I just really don't see our industry taking advantage of that. Another advantage is you don't have to have a pesticide spray license, so you don't have to sit through talks like this to get your credits. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here if you are here for information. Um, and, you know, application equipment for beneficials, you know, you can make yourself a blower for around $100, $125, which compare that to buying a sprayer, which you, you still will need a sprayer because you are still going to be spraying other products. Um, the actual equipment for bio application is not expensive. Now we are seeing more drone usage. Yes, that, that's going to raise it into a higher economic level, but that drone usage is really being done outdoors on large area crops and not in greenhouses um, at this time. So that said, I really want to thank BASF, Beneficial Insectary, TNLA, and BioWorks for sponsoring today. Um, I really appreciate um, these guys being so supportive of continuing education and um, furthering uh, the biocontrol industry and being supportive of, again, me, the industry, education, extension, and everything. And that said. Thank you so much. And a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>